So without further ado, I'll introduce the team from the Digital Learning Services Unit at the Department of Education and Training, Victoria. We're going to hear from Deb, Sam and Lauren. So uh, take it away, Deb. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and welcome everybody to uh, our Digital Learning Showcase. We're really appreciative of you choosing to spend your time with us this afternoon and we hope that we are able to give you some uh, good links to good resources and some new knowledge uh, to take away. So we want to uh, tell you a little bit about ourselves and a little bit about the um, things that we have to offer that hopefully can help you at this time. So just before we get started, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today and recognise their continuing connection to land waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And we would also like to acknowledge other elders and Aboriginal people who are here today. So hopefully um, that might include you. I've put a little tiny link down the bottom. You might see down in the bottom corner, it says Morung, and that's the Morung education plan for um, Indigenous curriculum. So if you're looking for some ways of embedding some Indigenous curriculum into your work, there's a little link there when you download our presentation, which will be available alongside the recording. You can um, click on that link and have a look at some great resources. So let's have a look at our, our agenda for today. We're going to look at uh, a few different aspects of the work that the Digital Learning Services Unit do. So there's some work we do around strategic planning for ICT, and I'm going to talk about that. And then I'll hand over to Sam, who will introduce the ARC platform. And that's going to be a wonderful thing for people who haven't seen it yet. They're going to love having a look at that. Lauren will then take us through making the most of Minecraft, and then she'll keep um, on rolling with um, what is now Microsoft 365 and um, G Suite. And then we might finish up with a few of the wonders of WebEx, which Sam will take us through. And then at the end, um, we'll have a QA and a time if there's some time left. But I think in between each section, if there, we'll ask for any questions pertinent to what we are talking about. So if you've got some questions, um, happy to pop for you to pop them in the chat and um, one of the team will respond to your questions there and we can highlight them in our uh, talk as well. So let's get started. I thought I would just um, give you a little bit of an idea of who the Digital Learning Services Unit is and, and we are a part of the education department that sits in curriculum and assessment branch. So our work is focused on all those things digital learning but it's a part of the bigger picture which is curriculum and assessment and if you look at that sort of flow chart at the beginning you can at the top there you can see how we lead back to um, the Secretary of Education, Jenny Adder, at that time. And that I've put a little picture of uh, the building that we work in when time is normal and uh, we're all going into the CBD. So that's where we, we work. It used to be called Nauru House um, back in the day. So that's, that's our office in town in Exhibition Street and Collins Street. But our work, that is what you want to know about, is primarily around looking at areas of policy and guidance and developing that the resources that go with that and the policies that guide the use of uh, information and communication technologies in our schools. We also partner with various jurisdictions and authorities and, and um, organisations, particularly our strategic partners such as DLTV, to provide um, a suite of um, platforms and applications. So that's our software suite that we um, utilise people like G Suite and Microsoft 365, ClickView and all of those. So we spend a lot of time working with those and making sure that we have got resources supporting them. We also maintain um, department digital platforms and we will tell you a little bit more about our newest platform in a little while, and that being ARC. And we work collaboratively across the department to provide um, professional learning. So we work with our regions, we work with BASTO, we work with our strategic partners to provide um, professional learning for educators across the system. And there's a, a part of our work that's around developing an evidence base for um, emergent and developing technology. So looking at what's the practice out there, what is best practice, what is the research telling us. And of course, at the moment, that area is being flooded with people who, universities, organisations who are looking at 
what does this remote and flexible learning mean for schools and education and the long term and, and teaching? So that's an interesting space um, for us to be looking at. And down the bottom there, I've put our digital dot learning at education email address. So if you had any questions or, or wanted to contact us at any time about anything, um, that's our address for you to, to contact us. So I'm going to take you through the first aspect that we wanted to share with you, which is what we do to support schools in strategically planning for ICT. So this is um, a little bit about me. I do a lot of work in this area and the creating um, school-wide strategic plans for um, ICT and digital technologies. Um, if you need to contact me in relation to that, there's my email address. And I also put out a lot of resources online on um, Twitter and Pinterest curate resources there. So if you're looking for that kind of resource, um, there's a couple of places you can go to. Basically, in my history, I spent most of my career as, as a classroom teacher, as a primary school teacher for 30 years, and I've been in the department for two years. So this is a relatively new part of my life. So I thought I might um, pop up this screen for you uh, just to have a look at. I'm not going to go through all of these statistics with you, but it is really interesting to get an overview of how digital learning and devices is across the state because we look at what happens in our schools but we don't necessarily know how that correlates with what's happening across the school and when you think about this is last year's results it's now 12 months old we don't have access to this year's uh, audit as yet but at this point last year there were um, 681 thousand, nearly 682,000 um, devices and computers in schools. So we're talking about a lot of uh, devices. And we, if we scroll along, we can see the breakdown of that um, into whether they're tablets or, or desktops or notebooks and whether they're Apple and whether they're Windows. Increasingly, Chrome, Chromebooks are coming into our classrooms. And then down the bottom, it tells you a little bit about the um, technology services that we have, over 700 um, technicians working in our schools. It's interesting having a look at how many emails there are. I think I get all of them. Um, feels like that, certainly. And the uses of G Suite and Office 365 and the, just the amount of data that is going through our system. It's absolutely phenomenal. Last year it was being measured in um, terabytes. This year I'm being told it's being measured in pentabytes and the largest measurement of data is brontobytes. So um, hope one day we'll be there I'm sure. But a good takeaway that most of our um, devices in schools, 87% of those student devices are mobile and dependent on our Wi-Fi system. So interesting statistics to take away, interesting for you to look at it and say oh where does our school fit in with all of that. So bearing in mind all of these statistics, well, what does that actually mean for us? And what it means for all of us is that there's a lot of time and money that's spent in government schools on digital learning. And for most schools, ICT is actually the second largest budget in the school um, expenditure behind staffing. And that's regardless of whether it's used effectively or not. So we are spending a lot of money um, on these devices and on the technologies in schools, and, and we need to make sure that they're making the impact that we desire. Um, back in 2013, the Auditor General commissioned a report into digital technologies in schools and they identified a significant issue. Now, the Auditor General creates um, reports all the time, so it's, that's not an unusual process for them to choose to um, audit digital technologies, but it's always very useful to find out what they've said and what suggestions they're making. So at this time, they said that they the issue they identified was a significant percentage of school money is spent on digital technologies, but it's often unplanned, it's often reactive, sometimes it's misinformed, it may not have a long-term vision, and it might not be connected to other school priorities. And they gave us um, some suggestions as to what the department needed to do. So their suggestion was we needed to provide a system-wide solution for supports with whole school planning around all aspects of ICT and implementation. And they said that school strategic planning needed to take into account not only the infrastructure and technologies, but also the, um, the teaching and learning requirements of school and emerging technologies so that we could look at planning and, and becoming more future proof. 
So we took that um, on board and there were two initiatives that came out of that. In 2014, the ICT strategic planning program was launched and it had two aspects to it. The first one was that a department online planning tool was developed and the online planning tool is not unlike SPOT. Um, it is a tool that you can go into to create your uh, digital learning plan for your school. And in line with that, ICT strategic planning workshops began in October of that year. And th they are statewide workshops where schools are invited to come along, learn how to use the online planning tool and listen to what current developments are and make plans for, for their school, a four year plan. So looking at the, um, online planning tool. I've popped a link in there that allows you to get to that online planning tool. So the access to that tool is automatic if you're in the principal class or if you're a school service technician, but it needs to be delegated to ICT leaders and teachers upon request. What you can download straight away is the matrix upon which um, the ICT planning tool is based. And you can see a little um, picture there of a Word document and a Fuse link which will take you straight to the digital learning matrix, which anybody can access straight away. And it helps you to go through and determine where your school is placed on 13 criteria around the implementation of digital learning in your school. So we, we go through the planning tool and schools determine whether they feel comfortable in making a four year plan, which is aligned to their strategic plan, or whether they are more comfortable in making 12 month plans, which align with their AIP. And they get to look at those 13 criteria and determine their ICT capability around that, whether they are emerging in that space, evolving, embedding or ex excelling in that space. And then that process becomes an iterative one based on the FISO improvement cycle. So you've got some links there and that will take you to um, that tool and to look at what the criteria are. So let me tell you a little bit about ICT strategic planning workshops. This might be something that you are interested in attending. These are face-to-face -face workshops. And so at the moment, we're not uh, hosting any of these workshops, but from term four, we'll be looking at an online version of those. So that's something to look forward to and um, perhaps subscribe to the digital learning news to find out when that, when that starts. So ICT strategic planning workshops are a collaboration. It's a, um, collaboration between our team, which is Digital Learning Services, and the Information Management Technology Division um, people. So the technical planning officers who work in that team together, we are in usual circumstances, will deliver around 10 full day ICT strategic planning workshops each term. And we do that in metropolitan and regional Victoria. So the workshops are free for schools to go to and normally they target school leadership and, and service technicians. So on average, we get three to four people per school attend and the workshops are capped at about 20, between 24 and 28 people so that everybody gets um, some personalised attention throughout the day and gets the opportunity to work with um, other, other schools as well. So what they do is, is help you to strategically plan for the use of technology in your school. There are three workshop options that you can choose to go to. There's the standard one, which people usually attend to find out how to use the tool. So the concentration there is how do we use this tool? How do we go about planning for that? Then when you, you are familiar with how to use the tool, we offer next steps which looks into things like well, what, are, what are the strategies for effective um, e-leadership and it doesn't spend as much time looking at what the tool is. It spends more time talking about what are the issues and how, what are some strategies to um, address those issues. And there's a little picture down the bottom that shows you what the tool actually looks like. So there are a variety of tabs to work through. This is just a quick graph showing you where we've traveled to in um, 2018, 2019. So that was uh, where the workshops were held. So we do try to capture most of the state and the response of um, people to the workshops. They're, they're very popular. We have a lot of return schools. 
Essentially, the work we do is help you to determine based on your AIP and your school strategic plan and, of course, how much uh, budget you have in how you're going to connect those digital dots. So what is it that you need to concentrate on in infrastructure? What kind of services are you looking for to help with that? And what are your teaching and learning outcomes? And we, we start with those teaching and learning goals and then move through um, the services and infrastructure. The good thing about the workshops is that you have a lot of expertise in the room to help you. So you've got your teaching and learning experts in the room, we've got the technology experts in the room, and you've got your colleagues in the room from other schools who can share that um, practice. So it's usually people come away with lots of good ideas and strategies for moving forward. We also have a lot of supporting resources, which you can actually access today. Um, that support that uh, workshop and there's a link down the bottom that takes you to the ICT planning page on FUSE and there's a number of packages there that have resources that support a lot of different interests across the curriculum. So if you're looking at um, gaming, there's a package there that talks about how you might do that. If you're looking at robot robotics or coding, there are packages of resources there. If you're looking for cyber safety, there's stuff there to support all of that, plus what you can see on the screen. So well worth um, capturing that uh, link there and then going and having a look at what's available on that site for you now that might help you in your um, planning journey. We also have some new uh, webinars coming out at the moment that are hosted on ARC and they will help with your planning for where you would like your school to take ICT and digital technologies further. So these are just some of the webinars that are coming up in the next couple of weeks that you might be interested in attending. These are all advertised on ARC, which is our, our new platform for advertising events and software. And before, we, before I go on any further, um, I'm just going to capture any questions that there might be about what I've said before I move across to Sam and she can tell you a little bit about ARC. So are there any questions, Nathan, for me? No? Just uh, just looking through, I, I know you may have answered this already, uh, Deb, but a question from Davin, uh, when the next workshops are, the last one was cancelled. I'm sure, um, Davin, you could inquire directly with, uh, with, with the team about that if you like, but um, are you able to... Happy to email me. I'll pop my email in the, in the chat in a moment and I can then let you know when um, sessions are coming up. We did have to cancel them. So earlier this year, we, we ran a number of workshops up until the beginning of March when we needed to cancel those and we're now currently planning for how we can effectively move the workshops online so looking we wouldn't run full day ones nobody wants to spend a whole day online but we would um, package those up and um, and look at positive ways of getting the best of those workshops into the online so if you um, email me I'll let you know more about that. I can see too that uh, Sam's answered a question there about independent schools accessing the resources. Cool. So the ICT planning page on FUSE is publicly available. Yeah. So. Thanks, Deb. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Sam to tell you a little bit about ARC. All right. So hopefully, can you just confirm that that's actually showing the ARC page now? Yes. For the presentation. See. Thanks. Sorry, I haven't got the um, presentation, the live feed from Google showing. Okay, so I'm going to quickly take you through ARC. Um, so what is ARC? It's basically, it's our new digital platform that we've recently launched in May um, to, we actually re have released it earlier than we expected to. So we're still doing some development work on, at it, on it at the moment. Um, but the idea is to have uh, a place for educators, Victorian educators to find events, both teacher and student events, to find the um, software that would normally be on the EduStar catalogue, um, to have that software now available through ARC. And coming in, hopefully by the mid to end of next year, uh, FUSE resources will, will also be incorporated into ARC. So it's going to have those three platforms, uh, live events, software tools, and uh, learning resources. So that will actually mean that FUSE eventually will be decommissioned and um, all of those or most of those resources will end up on ARC. So who are our key users? We have school leaders who can, provide, uh, can find professional learning for their staff um, and events for their students. Same with teachers, can look for events uh, both for themselves or for their students, as well as our providers. So we have a 
we have around uh, just a bit over 90, I think 95 providers online now. And um, we're expecting to grow that to around about 120 um, over the next couple of months as we continue the development of the program or the platform, sorry. So what's the user experience like? It's a very clean interface. We have a search bar that uh, we're still actually working on that. It's a little bit buggy still, but um, it's we have a tagging system. So we've tagged with curriculum or other keywords. Um, so if you're searching for a particular um, event or uh, learning uh, items or those kind of things, you can search, search in the search bar and that will bring up anything related to that topic that you're looking for. Um, we also have some filters, and some calendar views and all sorts of things. But as I said, we are still developing the tool and we, we're expecting to improve and continue to have um, functionality built in over the next month or two. If we look at some recent updates that have come, we now have embedded uh, video in event listings. So um, you can have little snaps, if, if our providers have got little snapshots of their event through video, uh, we're able to embed that. We've got WebEx integration. So that's integrated with WebEx events, not meetings. So if, um, if, if our providers are looking to do a webinar type um, presentation, that's all embedded into, into ARC already. We have a calendar search. So that's a fairly new, um, new part that's been brought out. So if you know, for example, week five of term three, you wanna be doing an excursion or a webinar or online, um, virtual excursion with your students, you can now search by date to find events that are on during that time. We have a new thing called channels, which uh, we've recently launched just in the last week or so. And I, I am gonna show you all of these live in a minute, but uh, channels are a way for certain topics or particular groups of providers to be able to come together and provide um, those uh, their events in one nice place that's easy to find. And the other thing that we have at the moment is a learning resource page. So this is to give you a bit of a look and feel of what this page might look like once the um, development of this has been completed. At the moment, it's just linking back to Fuse resources, but um, eventually, one, uh, probably in about a year and a half, we will have that development finished. So this is just a bit of a look and feel to see what that page will look like. So how do you access ARC? Uh, it's actually quite easy. You can just follow the link. I think um, Carly actually popped the link into the chat just before, but uh, follow the address https arc.educationapps.vic.gov.au. You'll need to sign in using your EduPass details. So that may be your um, TO number and password, or it may you may actually need to put your whole email address in there. If one doesn't work, try the other. Um, EduPass is sort of all over the place, I think at the moment. Um, and then you can just browse or search for events or software and if you're interested, if you're a department, uh, sorry, I should say this is only for department staff, hit that register button and that will automatically register you for events if they're internally managed or it will take you out to the registration page if you are not, um, if they're externally managed. If you're not from a Victorian government school, so if you're from the independent or Catholic sector or if you're homeschooling, for example, you can still browse events without signing in. So ARC is, you can look through all of ARC. Um, and you, and you will be able to hit the register button for events that have an external registration process. And those events will actually have a little box that um, tells you that it's gonna take you out to an external process. So if you hit that register button, it will take you out to the provider and you can use their registration system. We are looking at building in a process by which external um, non-DET teachers can also internally register for events, but we're not at that point yet. We just need to uh, have a look at some of the security issues that that can potentially bring about. Okay, I'm gonna show you ARC now live. So this is the landing page. When you first come into ARC, you will actually have a sign in button up here. So click on that button, put in your DET um, EduPass information and, um, and that will sign you in. So it's, it's using the EduPass single sign on. Um, so this is your landing page. When you come to ARC, you can see we've got a series of events um, the top sort of top four events that we're running. There's a bit of a blurb in here about WebEx. Um, we do need to update this. I have to say it's it's pointing to WebEx meetings, but we will be updating that with some information about WebEx events as well. And then we have our top hits on our software. From this page, you can uh, you can search in the search bar. You can use some of the navigation. We've got events, software, and learning. You have a notification bar, and there's some bits and pieces you can do in here. Your little person icon. 
Um, yours will look a little bit different. I've got lots and lots of providers, so you won't have those. But uh, you can, if you've if you've signed up for any events, they'll sit in this My Events. Um, if you've followed any providers, and I'll talk through that in a sec, they'll sit in here, so you can actually go straight to them quite easily. If you click on Settings, you can update your email notifications, so you can turn things on and off. If you don't want to get email, or if you want to be inundated with email, you could turn everything on. Um, I'm sure we don't need that, though. You can also sign out if you wanted to. Um, from here, you can click on the events and that will take you to our, the events page. So we have a big hero event, which is the big thing that we would like people to be going to. But down in here, you can just, um, so you can scroll down and we have some featured events, which are highlighted events that people may be interested in. And you can continue viewing and you'll just keep going again. We've got lots and lots of events at the moment. Um, and these events are listed in chronological order. So they are by date and then by time on that day where there's events on the same day. So that is one way that you can just scroll through and have a look. As I said earlier, you can um, hit the search bar. So I'm going to type in art if I'm interested in art events. And that will bring up your art events. It will also bring up um, your any channels that may have something to do with art, which obviously we don't at the moment. Um, the key event providers who have an art um, focus and any software related to that as well. So I'll just go back to events. Some other things that are in here, as I was just saying before, we have channels. So um, the idea with the channels is that we can have either a provider like Zoos Victoria, which has multiple sites and they've got three different provider pages, all of their events come into one page. So if I click on the zoos, you can see all of their Melbourne Zoo, um, Hillsville, Werribee Zoo, if I keep scrolling, there's some from Werribee as well. So all of the, their three provider pages are being brought into this one page. So if you're really keen to do something at one of the zoo sites and you're not sure where they are to scroll through the general events page, you can just come to the zoos channel and find that information there. Uh, we, can, we are also in the middle of developing different channels. So I've just created this one recently, assistive technologies and inclusion. So this one will be collecting uh, different events that are related to assistive technology or inclusion events. So we'll, we're also looking at creating some others for digital learning, for pedagogy, those kind of things. So we're in the process of just putting these together. Channels only launched last week, so they're still very new for us. Um, the other thing that I was uh, saying before, you can also just search our providers. So we have we have lots of providers online. Um, if you have a if you have a provider that you're really interested in and you want to know more about, uh, you can hit the follow button. It will ask you to confirm that you want to follow them. And what will happen then is whenever that provider lists new events, you'll get a notification. So that will sit up in your little bell. You can see I have many, many notifications. Um, but you'll be notified um, through that notifications process that that provider has put up a new event. So that's the main thing on events page. I'll just quickly show you, there are some filters in here. So if you're looking just for professional learning, you can choose that filter just for student events. There's a filter there. Um, these are, are more around how the delivery will happen and cost. We're actually looking at upgrade our, upgrading our filtering system um, related to sort of topics or possibly curriculum areas. So there may be some changes to filtering coming soon. Um, the other thing that you can do is the calendar view. So you can choose if I wanted to have um, events that are running in August. So I know this is the time or the weeks that I'm interested in or the days that I'm interested in. You can just select those days and then it will bring up the um, all of the events that are going on during that period of time. So I'm, I can then choose which one that I wanted to pick or more than one, you can choose as many as you like. So they're the key features of the events page. I'll quickly take you through the software page. Um, so this has got our packages that are on the Edgestar catalog and we're slowly migrating them over to ARC. Um, so at the moment we have G Suite, ClickView, Microsoft 365, Adobe, Boardmaker, LinkedIn Learning, Minecraft, and WebEx, so um, all of those, oh, and Wolfram are on here. So all of those are available to DET teachers. Some of them are just for secondary schools, some are for primary or, or some are for both. So um, there is information on each page. If we take a look at, um, let's have a look at Microsoft 365, for example, there's information about some of the different um, 
information and resources that you can just uh, click on to go to. It tells you how to access those um, for PC and Mac, how to um, where you can follow more the provider page, um, information you can find on LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning if you're interested in getting some training for, for different um, Microsoft products, for example, uh, the M Microsoft Education Center. So there's lots of links, tells you a bit about how to access it and that, any licensing restrictions that may be in place as well. The last page that I'll talk about is the learning page. So like I said earlier, this is really just a holding page right now. It is eventually where the uh, replacement for Fuse will be. So this will be our learning resources. So at the moment, it is just linking back to Fuse and packages on Fuse or some of our software packages, but um, it will give you a little bit of a, a sort of look and feel of what that might look like once we have launched um, that part of the program, uh, of the platform, sorry. But as I said earlier, it'll probably be a year, year and a half before we get to that. All right. Um, so Sean's just asked, is ARC a replacement for Fuse EduStar? So pretty much, yes, it will be once it is finished. So it, as I said before, it's probably about a 12 to 18 month um, um, period of time before that happens. Will these ARC resources be available to teacher education institutions? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. So feel free to clarify that. Um, at the moment, you can, um, oh, sorry, the learning resources. I think they will be, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. We're still working on our content strategy and looking into how that will work. Um, so that's part of the discussion that will be happening over the next couple of months while we're planning what will happen um, with that transfer from FUSE. So anything else? I think that was it. So that is my part of um, ARC discussion. So if anybody else has questions. Um, so yeah, Nikki, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know that we've had a final clarification on how that's going to work. I would imagine we would not have less availability or have it further locked down. Um, but that's part of the discussion that will happen as we're developing um, the next part of ARC over the next few months. Um, Given that to any teachers from any sector and pre-service, anybody basically can look at ARC already, I would imagine unless there's a licensing reason that we can't have other people have access, I would imagine um, it, that sort of level of access will remain the same. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Lauren. Thanks, Sam. Okay, hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm Lauren Arkley and I've recently just joined the Digital Learning Services team. Um, I'm not from Australia. Um, I was a primary school teacher in Scotland for a number of years and then I joined um, the region as a digital learning development officer. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here today and looking forward to sharing how you can make the most of Minecraft. Okay, for those of you who might not be that familiar with Minecraft, I'd just like to um, start with an explanation of how it can be used to enhance learning and teaching outcomes for your students. So a lot of people view Minecraft um, as just a game and for gaming purposes only. However, the Minecraft Education Edition has been designed for educational use. It has um, an open world environment, it enables and promotes creativity, collaboration and problem solving. Using Minecraft, teachers and students can create Minecraft worlds. So some students in schools have recreated things like their own school in Minecraft, um, or they may have recreated a setting from a story that they've been um, reading in class. And um, there's lots of examples out there online and um, really creative and imaginative ways to use it. Um, students can view their learning objectives within the game. So you can create um, boards within the game that can display information and students can also use those boards to convey information that they have learned. So they can put a board in there and explain um, a particular topic that they have been researching. And you can add a non-playing character into your game um, and you can embed digital resources within that character. So you can design a character, you can choose their outfit so it can fit into your setting really well within a Minecraft world. Um, and you can add certain information in there. So they almost act like a tour guide within the game. And what's really nice about that is you can set that up for your students or your students can um, include those in their own worlds to kind of convey um, a story. You can collaborate on projects together. So 
teachers can host worlds and share join codes with their students. And um, when the student enters the join codes, they can then all come together in one space. And I know that that's been popular during learning from home and um, where um, teachers and students have felt a sense of connection by coming into Minecraft. Um, so some schools have been doing a Minecraft Monday where they come in and join together as a class just to connect and to collaborate. But more than that, you can get your students to collaborate in building um, materials in Minecraft and designing together and planning. So it, it has lots of um, really powerful tools in there to help your students get together and collaborate. Um, Students can document their work using a portfolio and using the camera tool, which is um, designed particularly for the education edition. So students can take pictures of the work that they've done and it automatically saves inside that portfolio. And they can add in some text in there to describe what they've learned and reflect on that. And that portfolio can then be exported as a PDF. So you can use it um, in lots of different platforms. You can add personalization to the game so students can design and sort of um, remodel how their character looks, change their outfits and change their hairstyles, um, which I think I spent a bit of time on myself. And um, more so the education edition, um, it provides a safe environment for your students to connect and to collaborate in. Now teachers in Victoria are using Minecraft in their classrooms. Sorry, hang on, I'm just... And in June, we actually recorded over 26,000 unique users accessing the software. Now, we have lots of materials on our FUSE website, which we've made reference to with the other materials I'll just show you. Let's see. You should be able to see a different tab now. So this is our Minecraft resource page on FUSE. So in here, you'll find some tech support and um, you'll find information for teachers and for students and parents. And you'll also find some materials in there. There's things like um, lessons aligned to the curriculum. We've got our archaeology adventure, which is a fantastic resource that I would recommend that you have a look at. We've got some materials in there um, about remote learning. And it shows you ideas of using Minecraft um, in this remote and flexible learning period. We've also got the STEM eSports challenges that Minecraft Education Edition just released recently. And um, they're really good, so I'd encourage you to take a look. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different things in here that can help you to get started with your class. Now, recently, I thought it was um, important to mention, we ran an innovation um, cluster for Minecraft. So it involves schools across Victoria, and we also worked collaboratively with Microsoft and Dr. Bronwyn Stuckey. And unfortunately, like a lot of things, and we had to change our innovation cluster to go online because of the um, move to remote learning but we've still managed to stay connected and teachers have done amazing things inside Minecraft with their students. Now one example I wanted to share was um, student, one school planned to incorporate Minecraft into their inquiry sustainability unit and students were asked to research an endangered animal and then they had to design a suitable habitat for their chosen endangered animal and, and recreate that in Minecraft. And I had a look at it and the tour that they created was fantastic. Another really good resource that I'd highly recommend that you take a look at is our mini Melbourne Minecraft world. This was created um, in collaboration from the department and the Metro Tunnel project. So they've recreated the, a section of Melbourne, um, CPD, in Minecraft and the detail in it is amazing. Um, any Minecraft user can download um, the public version of it, um, but for the Minecraft Education Edition, there are resources to support its use in the classroom. So what I'm going to try to do is, I'm going to turn off my webcam just to save the bandwidth, and I'll put the video on so you can see it. Um,
The new Mini Melbourne world is fantastic. So with Mini Melbourne, students who are beginning to learn their directional language, even in the junior years, to be able to navigate their way through the city, and also in scavenger hunts as well, to find different places in there. But also with the historical sites in the city, we're so rich with some magnificent buildings, and to really delve into those in, in more detail. In archaeology adventure, I've learned that it's not all dinosaur bones under the ground and you can find many things. The archaeology adventure is a unique experience for students to put their feet in the shoes of an archaeologist, find out about their history and dig in a virtual space in Melbourne CBD. The Metro Tunnel project has offered a, a rare opportunity to examine the archaeology of the city that dates back to the gold rush and I think being able to look at so many different sites of various different natures is really interesting to uncover. Okay, I might just stop that there just in the interest of time. Um, I would highly recommend that you have a look at that. It's even good in lockdown just to take a wander around the streets of Melbourne and remember what it looks like. Um, how to get started. If you're from a Victorian government school, Minecraft Education Edition is provided free of charge for all teachers and students. And all you need to do is log into Minecraft using your EduPass account details. If you'd like some more training on how to get started in Minecraft, the Microsoft Training Teacher Academy is a perfect place to start. There's really good online and um, step-by-step tutorials in there and um, with lots of really good examples. Does anyone have Lauren, any questions? Lauren, there was a question from Tammy in the chat. Um, she asked, can you host online now, um, not being on the same LAN remotely? Yeah, you can. So you can share. I know that there's been a couple of technical issues with this, but you can share um, your world. You can host it. And then when you get the join code, you share that with your students and they should be able to go on with your join codes and then collaborate in the same world. Um, if anyone does experience technical issues, if they want to try that, there's a really good website that I'll add in um to the chat once i'm finished and it um, is a microsoft um minecraft education help desk so there's lots of people kind of talking about the same issues and they've got workarounds for it if there's problems but for the teachers that i've worked with in the remote learning setting they have managed to connect on a collaborative world is there any other questions for minecraft i think that was the only one thanks lauren Great. Okay, I'll keep rolling. Okay. <laughs> um, get oh, actually, board. Tammy, Tammy, sorry, just asked again. Are worlds saved in cloud now? The worlds are saved on the Minecraft like application on your computer, but you can upload them into the cloud. Um, I think that that's a recommendation when students are using shared devices that they save their world file and then upload it to the appropriate platform that the the class is using. Thank you. I hope that helps. Okay, Microsoft um, 365 and G Suite for Education. And we've got these tools available for all Victorian government schools. And please note that your school might have deployed its own local version of Microsoft 365 or G Suite for Education because there's a department version and often the school versions. If you're not sure what version that you are using, if you're using either, then it would be good to confirm this with your school IT technician. So there's a couple of benefits associated with using the department managed tenant, which I'll just share just now. So 
Um, it relieves schools of a technical and admin burden and also provides the following. So we've got the department assumes responsibility for the management and maintenance of the service. And we carry out the privacy impact assessments for G Suite and M365. Um, and that covers all schools using the suite. And the department monitors and manages any updates and tests them um, on behalf of schools. Now, with Microsoft 365 and G Suite, I could talk all day <laughs> about what all these tools can do because there's lots of really fabulous things available. These are some of the tools that we have available on our department tenant. So we've got Microsoft Teams and Google Classroom. We've got Microsoft Sway in there where we can do digital storytelling. We've got Google Slides, Google Forms. There's, there's lots of tools there. If you'd like to find out more information about those tools and how you can use them in your classroom, we do have our ARC software page, which Sam referred to in her presentation. And um, you can go to that page and you can find lots of really useful links. Some of those links also go back to our Fuse pages for that software, um, where there's lots of how-to guides and there's also notes on professional learning in there as well. Now, before I hand over to Sam, I wanted to play this video, um, and this is about video conferencing. And the reason it's um, a good time to do that now is because with Microsoft and Google tools, you can video conference with your students, um, as well as WebEx, which Sam's about to talk about in a moment. This um, video has been created by the department, and it's an animation that is um, it focuses on the protocols that you should have with your students when conducting a video conferencing session. So I'll just play it just now, you'll be able to see. The Department of Education is providing video conferencing solutions to keep Victorian state school students connected to learning. Here's some info to help parents feel comfortable with their children connecting to classes via video. Lauren, you might just want to boost the volume a little bit on the video. The Department of Education supports, like Cisco WebEx, Microsoft Teams, and Google Meet. Video class links are shared securely to keep our students safe. So please remind your children not to share them anywhere. Teachers have been given the tools and training to protect and supervise video classes, just like at school. You can help your child learn online too. Create a quiet and neat learning space. Remember anything that's in your background is seen and heard by everyone, barking dogs included. Above all, help your child to be respectful and fair to others during classes and follow the online rules or protocols. Remind them to turn off mobile phones, refrain from eating online, and keep their microphone on mute when not sharing. Your school might have their own online rules or protocols for you to follow too. Teachers may record classes if they have written consent from you as a parent. Please remember to check in with your child at the beginning and end of each day to see how their online learning went and what help they might need from you or their teacher for tomorrow. Video conferencing connects students, parents and teachers to their school community while learning from home. For more information on learning from home, visit our website. Okay, um, this video is available as a link on Fuse, so I'll pop it into the chat um, after I'm finished um, so that you can access it. Um, are there any questions about Microsoft tools or Google tools? I'm just mindful of time. I think we've got 10 minutes left. Um, I can't see any coming up in the chat. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. No, I'll pass over to you, Sam, so that you can present. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, I am going to talk very quickly about WebEx. Um, I'm sure most Victorian government teachers are somewhat familiar with WebEx now, um, but what you may not be familiar with is the fact that we have access to three key platforms or products within the WebEx suite. Um, one of those is WebEx Teams, and this is one you might actually not know very much about, but should actually be already on your department laptop if you have one. And it is um, a really, useful tools similar to MS Teams um, or I guess Google, not really Google Classrooms, but definitely close to um, MS Teams if you um, are familiar with that product. We also have WebEx Meetings and WebEx Events. So I'll just go through what they do. Um, so WebEx Teams provides a space for your teams to collaborate within your school setting or for example, as we use it uh, within our department teams and across teams. You can use it to create small groups and spaces for different participants. So for example, if you have uh, PLCs or KLA teams or your leadership teams and your middle leaders, you can create groups for all of those and they can communicate, uh, share files, do all sorts of things in those group spaces. 
You can use WebEx Teams for calls or for meetings, both with individuals or with team members. There is a chat functionality, functionality excuse me, built in, so you can have a sort of running chat stream with team members. You can also invite external participants to join teams. So if you, for example, work with a critical friend or if you worked with a someone who's facilitating professional learning or with someone from another school, for example, you can actually um, invite those people into your team um, and create a group space where you can collaborate together. So it does enable small group functionality, similar to a breakout space. It's definitely not a breakout space, but you could use it in that um, in that way if you were looking to facilitate some meetings uh, with your school staff, for example. Um, WebEx Meetings is a video conference functionality. It is um, basically has all participants with the exception of the host on an equal footing. So anybody can share their screen, anybody can um, mute or unmute themselves. There is for the host a bit, a bit availability to um, mute all, to be able to modify who can share things and uh, who can share content, um, who can share video, those kind of things. So there are some controls in there, but it is definitely on a, um, places everybody on a much more sort of even footing over what they can do. There is polling and chat available, and there are some security measures. For example, you can lock your room, you can um, expel people if you need to, you can put people into, um, I've forgotten the name of it now, it's been a while, but you can put them into like a timeout place, but um, yeah, I've forgotten the actual name for it off the top of my head. Um, so WebEx meetings is the thing we use for um, a lot of professional learning for teachers. We've run uh, meetings with up to eight or over 800 participants in them uh, when we were doing training for WebEx last term in the term one, um, term two school holidays. So it, you can actually have up to about, yeah, thank you, put them in the lobby. Thanks, Deb. I really couldn't remember that word. Um, so we can have up to a thousand people in a meeting. Obviously, if you're going to have um, things with students, I would not be putting something with a thousand students or up to a thousand students in a meeting because you can unmute yourself. However, a hard mute button is coming, but not for a while for Webex meetings. So the other option, if you are looking for something um, where you can have a more webinar style functionality. So you can lock down, you can provide, you can give attendees very limited privileges where they, their uh, video is off, they're, mute, they're um, permanently muted, so it's a hard mute and they cannot unmute themselves, then WebEx events may be um, the answer that you're looking for. You still have the ability for your presenters to be able to share screens, content, video and transfer files. You can allow, um, your attendees, so your students, for example, to be able to do some of those things by giving them privileges. There is polling and there is some chat which you can turn on or off um, depending on how you set it up. And you can actually have multiple presenters and panelists in your event. So these are the sorts of things if we, if you were running like a whole school assembly, for example, you might look to use that uh, WebEx events for that. At the moment, our license again is for up to a thousand. However, we do have a small number of licenses that are available for up to 3000. If you were running an event where you would need more than a thousand people coming in, um, I would recommend that you contact Digital Learning Services. And if someone from my team could put the email address into chat, please. Um, and we can let IMTD, the IT group in the city, know that you would need more people um, available, more than a thousand. So you can have up to 3000, but we have we only have a, a small number of um, licenses to enable that. Um, how do you access WebEx? You go to um, https at edgevic.webex.com and that is the department's um, particular tenancy of WebEx. You then sign in using your EduPass details. So um, it'll initially, there's a box that's in the middle and it will ask you to put in your email account and then it will take you to the EduPass sign-in box. And I can't remember if you need to put in your email or your TO number, but whichever one, um, put in your EduPass details in the little pop-up that will come up and um, that will take you into the home page. I'll show you what it looks like in a second. You can download, um, if you go to the downloads from the menu on the left-hand side, there's a whole bunch of products you can actually download and that makes your life much nicer. So you can um, download the desktop app and that will then um, 
give you little join buttons straight away so you don't actually have to go through the, the web-based version if you want to just be able to join meetings and that kind of stuff. Um, however, from that Eduvic page, you can schedule meetings and events from that homepage. Um, so I'll show you that just in a sec. I've got one more slide here to go. What is coming to WebEx? I am very, very excited about some of the things that are coming. So just recently, we've had virtual backgrounds where you can have blurring, you can have, um, there's got a couple of little pictures that you can add in. So that's just happened recently. If you click the three dot button um, and go into your camera settings, it'll be in there. But we are having custom virtual backgrounds. And as far as I know, that is coming next week or maybe the week after. Um, there's going to be a bit of an improved cleaner layout in meetings and events. So the buttons that at the moment sort of sit halfway over your face will be right down the bottom and always accessible. The mute button is changing. So it'll be green when you're talking, red when you're not talking. So that's a nice change that we're looking for. There's also a new music mode. So if you're a teacher, um, especially a music teacher and you're playing music, it will now actually recognize, you can go in click music mode and it will recognize that you're playing music and it will actually record that. Previously, it was um, for a lot of teach music teachers, it was filtering that out as background noise. Um, but the big, big news, which we're super excited about, is video capable breakout rooms, which we're expecting to be available around about October. So I had a play with it yesterday and it was really great how it worked. So um, you went out into your breakout room and you could allocate people into different breakout rooms. And then when the breakout time was over, it just was zipped you back into your regular, the bigger meeting that was going on. So that was really exciting to see that functionality. All right, I'm just gonna escape out of here and I will show you what um, WebEx looks like. So um, there's actually, when you first come in, there'll be a sign in here and you put in your edumail, edu, edumail or education um, address and then you sign in using EduPass. It already remembers mine, so it's gonna take me straight. Oh, no, it didn't, timed out. So here we go, I'll give you a little quick demo. Um, it's remembered my EduPass because I haven't saved. I've been on here so many times. So then it takes you to your um, home screen. So you can download different apps from in here. Um, so the desktop app is definitely something I would recommend. But also if you've got on a mobile, um, you can put the app on and it makes it so much easier to attend things. You can even just be going for a nice walk around the block um, while you attend your meeting. So there's all sorts of things you can download in there, including calendar apps, add-ins and those kind of things. Um, you can schedule meetings, so you can schedule different types of meetings. This one is for using meetings. If you wanted to have an event, you click down here. There is a training center, which actually does have breakout rooms, but it doesn't have video breakout rooms. I don't use it. It's not that great, the interface. So um, I'd, ha I'd hang out and wait until we have the video ones if you have, if you have the ability to do that. And I'm very conscious that we've now gone over time. So I'm going to um, just get back to here. And I think we had just a little bit of uh, information about our contacts. So social medias, um, we've got a Twitter page that we're relatively active on when I can be. Um, I'm the main person on there. I think Deb sometimes jumps on there as well. We do have our email account, digital.learning at education.vic.gov.au. And we have a digital newsletter. So if you're interested, feel free to sign up. We um, try to get that out sort of every month or two. So we don't inundate you <laughs> too much, um, but please do join us on there. Uh, any questions before we finish up? I can't see anything in chat, so feel free to pop anything in now. We have no time left, but I'm happy to answer a few if you're willing to stay behind a little bit. Do Google Meets have breakout rooms? That's one for Lauren. Yeah, no, they don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the street so, answer there. Yeah. So look, it's, it's Kev from digital learning here. Um, I'd just like to thank Deb and Lauren and Sam. That's really informative. I'm, I'm just um, thinking maybe we should have made this two webinars. <laughs> but, <laughs> mate, we, we will continue our webinar series next term in 2021. So maybe we'll have a chat about how to do a little series because I think people are genuinely interested. And it's really nice that a lot of the DET uh, resources are available to everyone, which I think is fantastic. So. Anyway, thank you again. So, Nathan, anything from your end? No, I'll just echo Kev's thanks. Um, thank you to our attendees as well. Thanks for coming in. And